Hello. Welcome to Understanding Wine Sensory. My name is Thomas Booth. I am a graduate from the Wine and Viticulture Program at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a concentration in Enology. I'm also a certified Level 1 sommelier, or a wine connoisseur, so to speak. First, I want to show you a little clip. Say that's a 92. It's real, it's real spicy. Definitely a little asphalt. Yeah. Blueberries. Yeah. Prime steak roasted over uh, parsnips and carrot. Tastes jammy. Wow, that smells like burning rubber. It's kind of earthy. Gorgeous. Just get essence of love. Do you guys get the number two pencil in here? It's all over my nose. Romance. Look at the legs on that one. Don't you love the horse saddle on this one? Uh, I hate how I get such wine mouth. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, what's this we're drinking now? Gosh, I wouldn't expect it to be red. I've never seen a red Zinfandel. I don't. <laughs> so, where do people come up with these things? Well, there are many wine drinkers out there. As ridiculous as that may have seemed, there aren't really many wrong answers when there's tasting wine. Not only do the concepts I present here apply to wine tasting, but tasting all foods and beverages for that matter. So did you know that tasting wine in general is impossible without the use of your nose and brain? Being able to describe specifically what you taste in wine and whether you like it requires an understanding of palate's physiology taste descriptors, and what I like to call palate psychology. Now that I've laid out the subject of my presentation, I will first discuss palate physiology. So, you perceive four basic tastes on your tongue. Sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Now, due to genetic code, people have slightly varying numbers of taste buds, but the majority is approximately 9,000. However, the number of taste receptors, or palpi, varies significantly between individuals. Taste sensitivity is based on how many palpi you have. This is based on my teachings at Cal Poly. The more sensitive you are to the basic tastes, the higher number of palpi and potentially taste buds you may have. Now, there are super tasters out there who have 10,000 plus taste buds and may, for example, dislike vegetables or coffee for being too bitter. There are parts of the mouth where you are more sensitive to these basic tastes. For example, you have the tip of the tongue, which is sweet, the sides of the tongue, which are sour, the back of the tongue and throat, which is bitter. Um, also, salty lingers on the tip of the tongue as well. Now, there's a misconception that these are the only areas where you perceive these tastes, but that's not true. Every area picks up these perceptions, however, these parts seem to be more sensitive. Moving along with palate physiology, nerve endings in the tongue send taste signals to the brain. In order for the brain to perceive flavor, the taste signals must integrate with smell signals produced from olfactory nerve endings in the nose. Here is a simple diagram describing this process. In order to emphasize this point, Think back to a time when you were sick with a stuffed nose. Could you really perceive anything? Another little experiment you can do on your own is find any little spice in your house. Plug your nose and dab a bit of it on your tongue. Do you perceive anything? Now let go of your nose. You will be shocked by how much flavor depends on the use of your nose. Now, to sum all this together, I provide a little clip from the motion picture sideways. Hold the glass up and examine the wine against the light. You're looking for color and clarity. Now, stick your nose in. There's some strawberry. Oh, there's just a flutter of like a like a nutty Edam cheese. When do we drink it now? Mmm. Are you chewing gum? No. Spit it out. I find this clip quite funny because. Uh, Paul Giamatti is describing the wine using different taste descriptors, which is the next topic. Uh, but then you have the other side of the coin, the amateur wine taster over here who uh, doesn't understand why chewing gum 
uh, is bad. Well, it actually dis interferes with his olfactory nerves, which we just talked about. So we have red and white wine descriptors. Keep in mind when tasting wine the four basic tastes. Depending on your taste sensitivity, you will not like all wines. Here are some descriptors the next time you try. First you have tannic. These have to do with the bitter and astringent notes in wine. Wine is astringent if it makes your gums dry, sometimes so much your lips easily stick. Remember when perceiving bitterness, it occurs in the back of your tongue or throat. Next is tart. Sour wines will literally make you pucker. Keep in mind the sensitive size of the tongue that perceive this. Sweet wines contain small amounts of sugar. An example is white Zinfandel. In the industry we call this grandma wine. It's the pink stuff you may have seen in the stores for very cheap or in your grandma's fridge. Next is complexity. Wine can be very complex. Sometimes bitterness can be confused with spice flavors like tobacco or earthy flavors like minerals. Sweetness can be confused by heavy fruitiness. Here is a general flavor wheel. You can see the submenus all around here. It goes to show you just how many things wine can produce. After discussing descriptors, now it's time to talk about palate psychology. So putting everything into pers perspective, our wine preferences are affected by the strength of the taste signals coming from the mouth and smell signals from the nose. But there's also a huge effect by life experiences, aspirations, family, culture, learning, education, peer dyna dynamics, just to name a few important influences. So here's a situation between a father and daughter. You have two different things going on here. You have a family memory and you also have a cultural aspect. Would you consider this a positive or negative thing to associate with wine? I'd say positive. Positive reactions. What you enjoy in that moment and remains in your memory. Olfactory nerves send signals to the section of the temporal lobe involved with memory, particularly memories of place. This is the reason why smells can evoke powerful memories of your experiences. Sometimes it's all about the experience. Maybe you'll always go back to that one plummy cabernet you had at your crazy birthday, but not because it's top of the line wine, but because it reminds you of an awesome experience. Negative reactions. We have taste aversion. Sometimes the brain will interpret tastes and flavors negatively when they are associated with bad experiences. Examples of this could be food poisoning or over drinking, at which point even the sight and sounds of these particular foods or drinks will make you gag. Finally, I want to talk about acquired taste. I apologize for the wordy slide, but Dr. Ellen Bernstein, professor of psychology at Washington State, sums it up very well. If you really hate something, having it over and over again may not change it, but we know people develop tastes for something. In social settings, you have to eat things you may not like, but eventually you acquire a taste for it. I've come up with two different examples. Looking the part at a fancy monthly business mingle requires your indulgence in caviar. Again, you want to look the part, so eventually you learn to like it. The second example is more personal. You may have never liked White Zinfandel, but since you enjoy your weekly storytelling, free drink visits to Grandma's house, gradually you acquire a preference for it. Hey, Grandma. So the next time you taste wine, keep in mind palate physiology and psychology, as well as wine des descriptors, to give yourself a fundamental understanding of wine sensory and your preferences. Keep an open mind and an open palate. There's tons of wine out there with tons of different descriptors and you never know what good experience you'll have with it. Thank you for your attention. Always drink responsibly.